Good evening and welcome to the 2020 General Election Candidates Forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Amarillo. I'm Sonia Letson, President of the Amarillo League. This forum is being produced and co-sponsored by Panhandle PBS. And through their technical expertise, we are able to bring you many more candidates than you would usually get to see since travel to the Panhandle is not a factor. As you may know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which operates at the national, state, and local levels. There are over 700 local leagues across the country. The League of Women Voters of the United States is 100 years old this year, and the League of Texas is actually a year older than that. The Amarillo League is 70 years old. On behalf of our members, some of whom who have been active for over 40 years, as well as those who joined last week, we are so pleased to be able to present this forum to our community. The League does not endorse or oppose candidates or parties. We want active and informed participation in government at all levels, and we seek to register, educate, and motivate every citizen to vote. We believe that our democracy works best when everyone participates and that voting should not be difficult. Voting should be easy and convenient. Yesterday on the deadline, League volunteers registered 423 voters in Amarillo and Canyon. And over the past two months, close to 1,000 voters in all. Now that the deadline has passed to register to vote, we turn to education. We educate voters through forums like this one and also through our voters guide. The guide is now available at public libraries and many businesses in Amarillo and Canyon. You can also use the League's online voters guide, vote411.org, where you can create and print out your personalized ballot. Vote411.org has the candidate information found in the printed guide, but it also has more, such as candidate videos and links to websites and social media. Remember, you cannot use your cell phone in the polling place, but you can take a voter's guide or other paper list so that you can remember your choices. And as you will see tonight, there are many races on the ballot. So study the races and issues, decide how you want to vote, then make a list to take with you. Early voting begins on October 13th. That's only one week away. Be sure to vote early this year. Election day is November 3rd. You can find a list of polling places and times in the voter's guide or on vote411.org or by going to your county election administrator's website. For answers to questions about voting by mail, hand delivering a mail ballot, curbside voting, what to take to the polls as ID, and many other topics, see the voter's guide or call your elections administrator. And don't forget, when you go to vote, thank the election workers. They are making it possible for us to exercise our right to vote. Tonight's forum has been organized by the League's Director of Forums, Linda Vaughn, and will be moderated by Jill Gibson, the Chair of Media, Arts, and Communication at Amarillo College. Thank you all for joining us. I will now turn the program over to Jill Gibson. Hi there, I'll be your moderator this evening and we anticipate the forum will last about two hours. There are 14 contested races we're going to cover and we have 24 candidates participating. So the races will be presented in the order they appear on the ballot, starting with the race for US Senate. Because we have so many candidates, our time will be limited. We're going to proceed in ballot order and each candidate will be asked to give a one minute introduction describing their background, qualification, and reasons for seeking office. After the introductions, the candidates will be asked questions solicited by the league from the public, and the number of questions will depend on the nature and level of the office they are seeking. The candidates will have one minute to answer each question, and candidates, please pay attention to the clock on your screen. When the clock turns red, it's time to stop, and since this is Zoom, we can mute you. Please do not refer to your opponent or opponents in your remarks. Also remember that the forum is being presented live over Zoom and will be recorded, so keep your remarks appropriate for a general audience. 
if a candidate has declined our invitation to appear, I'll let the audience know of any reason that was given. It's also, of course, possible that we may have unexpected emergencies or technical difficulties in this new format. So um, I also need to mention the rule regarding the appearance of a single candidate in a contested race. In national races, federal law prohibits the league from allowing a single candidate in a contested race to present a campaign speech. So in national races, we will only be able to proceed if we have at least two candidates in attendance. For state and local races, these restrictions do not apply. And we will hear from state and local candidates in those uncontested races. So after the contested races with candidates, we'll hear from two speakers on the subject of the three city of Amarillo propositions on your local ballot. Those speakers will each have one minute on each of the three propositions to discuss the arguments, either pro or con. After that discussion of the city propositions, we'll present a series of one minute videos from uncontested candidates on your ballot. All uncontested candidates were invited to present a one minute video outlining their plans for the office they're seeking and six candidates have submitted videos for you to view. Those are all the general rules. Candidates, please identify yourself when you log in as a, as a panelist so we can promote you to the panelist position. And we are about ready to begin with the US Senate race. Um, in the Senate race, we have uh, Republican John Cornyn who will not be appearing tonight, Democratic candidate MJ Hagar, Libertarian candidate Carrie McKinnon, and Green Party candidate David Collins. And so we will begin with, do we have all the panelists joining us yet? Um, looking to see, we have David Collins. Okay, we have Carrie McKinnon. We are waiting on MJ Hagar. MJ Hagar is now arriving. Okay, and candidates, please make sure that you have your mics unmuted. Um, and so we will start with the first question, which is the introduction question. Tell us about your training experience and background that qualifies you for this position. And we'll begin with Democratic candidate MJ Hagar. MJ, not here still. Okay, so we'll move on to um, Libertarian candidate, Kerry McKinnon. Hello, I'm Kerry McKinnon. I was born and raised in Texas. I actually live in Petersburg where I was born. I've lived across the country. I have served in the United States Naval Reserves. I have worked for 25 years in retail and restaurant management, and I have served on elective committees in the Libertarian Party at the state level. My campaign is simple, individual liberty for all, period. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will turn to David Collins for your training experience and a little bit about your background. Good evening. I meet the constitutional qualifications to be a United States Senator as far as age and citizenship, but I have been a Texas resident for 45 of my 57, almost 58 years. I've been a Green Party activist since the Green Party of the United States began 20 years ago, but this campaign is not about me. This campaign is about the people. It's about providing an option for those who dream of remaking society and government to benefit all the people, not just the top 1% in income and wealth. We, the 99%, are tired of watching the United States become a third world nation with inequalities of income and wealth reaching 1890s levels. The people need and demand better paying jobs, more and better transportation options, better childcare and education, toxic air, water. The people want a world that is livable for the that follow them. To come need a peaceful revolution, which the Green Party and I think about. People, planet, and people over profit. That is the Green Party's central message. Thank you. Okay, now we will turn back to Mr. McKinnon. And the question is, 
what what will you do over the long term to ensure access to quality health care for all people? Well, I think what we have to look at is the fact that we have had Obamacare that was then opposed and nothing else was offered in its place. If we look at the VA that we have, we can see that having something that works in that in that fashion that is just strictly from the government limits access, increases wait times, and doesn't always serve the individuals. I think what we need to do is make sure that healthcare is offered across state lines and let individuals be able to work within the free market to drive those prices down. There's always going to be a few people that are not going to end up having healthcare access in a preventative way, but there will always be that emergency care provided by those hospitals that are great, especially on the South Plains and the Panhandle. Same question for Mr. Collins. What would you do over the long term to ensure access to health care for all people? We would do what other countries have done, other countries that are of similar standard of living to the United States, and that is uh, put together some sort of single payer universal health care system. We'd like to call it improved Medicare for all. Um, <clears throat> in this year of the pandemic, we have seen the proof that we need a system very much like that. We need to make sure that people don't go broke just because they catch some sort of virus uh, or end up in the hospital and unable to afford their care. Uh, we need to extend that care to everybody. We need to also be able to, pair, uh, to pay <laughs> caregivers a uh, universal basic income. Uh, we're working full-time taking care of our elders and our children. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the Green Party has been in favor of this particular method for its entire 20-year existence at the national level. And it's only at the national level we can implement this. We can't do this on a state or local level because we need to make the risk pool as large as possible uh, for the benefit of everybody. Thank you. Mr. McKinnon, what actions, if any, would you take to make sure that all eligible voters have access to safe and fair elections? Well, I would say that those that want to do mail-in ballots should be able to do so. In, in the time of COVID, we have seen how important it is for us to have access to everything that not only the government deems essential, but we as individuals deem essential. And for many of us, our right to vote is essential. And I think that we need to make sure that we have as many polling places as we can. We need to have those mail-in drop-offs available. I think that it's difficult sometimes when you want to make sure that someone is not voting twice, but the amount of voter fraud is not happening at the voter level. It is happening more so with those that are in control of some of those voting mechanisms and changing those or not allowing that to happen. We do have poll watchers and encourage more individuals to become poll watchers to keep that a fair and safe voting process. And now to Mr. Collins, what actions would you take to ensure all el eligible voters have access to fair and safe elections? Mr. McKinnon gets an awful lot right in that response. I applaud that. We also do need to make sure that state and local governments are not in uh, undertaking these programs to limit the franchise. Uh, we've seen where they just, uh, Greg Palast has a lot of great work on this as far as uh, interstate cross-check and other methods that states have used to knock people off the, off the voting rolls just because maybe they have the same name as somebody who no longer lives there. And that name might happen to be stereotypically African-American or Latino-American. That's got to stop. In addition, the Green Party has always been in favor of ranked choice or approval voting, something that guarantees that the winner of the election gets a majority of the vote. That also is uh, going to make it a lot friendlier for a multi-party democracy like the rest of the civilized world has uh, instead of this a duopolistic choice that we have between two parties that are moving ever rightward year after year. Mr. McKinnon, once our economy recovers, how would you reduce our national debt? 
raising taxes, reducing expenditures. Explain what you would do and how you would do it. So what we'd have to do is we'd have to really look at some of the sacred cows that both of the parties of the duopoly tend to fight against cutting. Uh, one of those being our military. And by doing that, we, we work on closing some of the bases that we have around the world. We also look at ending the wars and military conflicts that we're in at this time and making sure we're bringing those individuals home and not just talk about it, actually do it. We need to look at the ABC agencies. So that would be the ATF, ICE, uh, the IRS, those things to eliminate them from those budget, budget happenings that we have. The other thing that we need to do is we need to reevaluate how we do our uh, help and aid to other countries. We do not need to be giving military aid to other countries. We need to work toward pulling that back and starting over and only doing food and infrastructure. Thank you. And the same question for Mr. Collins. Once our economy recovers, how would you reduce our national debt? Uh, what would you do? Raise taxes, reduce expenditures, et cetera. Well, first of all, someone has put in the chat that it's customary to alternate who gets to go first. And uh, it's really not fair for me to have that extra minute to think about my answer to these questions. So I wouldn't mind going first a couple of times. Uh, we would uh, go along with uh, the libertarians as far as decreasing the size and scope of our military, getting overseas bases closed, getting us out of those military involvements that are costing us trillions of dollars a year that could be spent on real programs that benefit the people. Again, uh, we need to be seen as a force for good in the world, not as a, a force that enforces uh, imperialism, which is basically what all of our military adventures overseas have been about, making the world safe for corporatocracy. Um, let's bring the troops back home. Let's train them to do something like uh, disaster relief, for example. The National Guard has a great reputation, having done a great job for decades on that. How about our regular um, <clears throat> military be trained to help? Think of the, the, the tsunami in 2004. A quarter of a million people died, millions of people suffering. Let's send our troops overseas to help these people. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for that suggestion, Mr. Collins. We are going to now move on to the next race. So thank you, gentlemen. The next race is the race for US Congress and Republican Ronnie Jackson is not appearing tonight because his staff advised he has a prior commitment, but we will be joined by Democrat, Democratic candidate Gus Trujillo and Libertarian candidate Jack Westbrook. And I see that both of them are joining us now. So we are going to start with Mr. Trujillo with the introduction question. If you could tell us about your training, background, and experience that qualifies you for this position. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Gus Trujillo, and I am uh, born and raised right here in Amarillo, Texas, where I've lived all of my life. And uh, there was only a few years there where I actually lived in Washington, D.C., and uh, I was an intern for Congressman Thornberry, who is, which is the seat that uh, I am trying to fulfill now in Congress. So uh, I have been, I've went to all public schools here in Amarillo, Texas, and I went to Amarillo College, a local community college, and West Texas A&M University, where I got a bachelor's in business administration. Uh, I would say that my main qualifications are not only being a, a really active member of the community and trying to improve neighborhoods and the city uh, itself, but also uh, my time up in Thornberry's office, where as a Democrat, I still looked at both sides of the issues and uh, try to think of common solutions that will help all of us. And that's what my campaign has been about, is uniting the country and moving forward with common solutions. Thank you. Now we are going to turn to Libertarian candidate Jack Westbrook, so you can introduce yourself, tell us about your training experience and background. Um, sir, I think your microphone is muted. There How you about go. now? Much better. All right. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and everyone involved in putting this together. Uh, my name is Jack Westbrook. I am the Libertarian candidate 
for Congress in District 13. I have lived in uh, this district for 10 years, have family that's lived in this district for all of my life. Uh, I have family members, uh, four of whom all have degrees from this area, from uh, Midwestern State University to Amarillo College and, and the local schools here. So uh, my roots are here uh, to some extent. And my experience is that I spent 14 years in the Air Force. I'm a veteran. After that, uh, I, I got out. I spent uh, 10 years in full-time ministry. I'm still a minister and elder uh, in the church. And in addition to that, I've been to Afghanistan three times and Kuwait three times in, so in support of the warfighter as a document control manager for a $4 billion company. I apologize. I can't see the clock, so I don't know how much time I have. You are um, out of time, so. Okay. That was the end of your time, but I'm going to keep you up here for the next question, which sure. is, what actions, if any, do you believe are needed to address the health and economic impact that's currently being caused by COVID-19? Well, it's very easy to, um, you know, go 2020 and uh, look back and see what has happened. Um, there's a lot of concerns about, you know, how we go about this and, oh, let's listen to the scientists. And the question is, well, which scientists? Because we have different scientists saying different things. And the answer to, to that, in my opinion, is, as we libertarians say, to do what, what you have the liberty to, liberty, uh, liberty to do. And that is um, for each person to go to their doctor and use the advice of their doctor and for all of us to be considerate of others as we go along. Turning to Mr. Trujillo, the same question. What actions do you believe are needed to address the health and economic impact of COVID-19? Yes, we are going to have to rebuild the economy so that, so that it is much fairer for everyone. Because even before COVID-19, it seemed like the economy had been in uh, favor of the very wealthy and uh, corporations. And, uh, you know, I have a uh, background in working with the community with the small businesses. So I always... I'm a big supporter of small businesses. And so I think that uh, when the new Congress comes into the, in the session next time, they have to in, introduce, I would actually introduce legislation that would help small businesses first, uh, not only to uh, regular citizens, but small businesses, and then later on corporations. Because the reality is, is that after this virus is over with, the corporations are going to have enough money to survive, but the small businesses are not. Uh, and uh, that, this, this is also not even counting the uh, suffering that many people who were in the middle class have slipped into poverty because we see it with the food banks and uh, a for kids here in Amarillo and everything where there are long lines to get food. So that shouldn't happen in America. Thank you. Mr. Trujillo, I want to move to a completely different topic. What is your position on the proposed transfer of high-level radioactive waste from nuclear reactors in the eastern United States through the 13th District to private storage sites in New Mexico and Andrews County, Texas? I actually do not support uh, the high radioactive material being transferred through Texas. I know that the risk for an accident happening is very high, but not only that, uh, just being near that kind of radioactivity is very dangerous, especially for our communities that they are going to be passing through. I know that uh, they want to, the company who is, is offering to store this is uh, more in it for profit than actually the safety of uh, the people, especially in the surrounding area. Now, I guess what concerns me is that if they, I know that they are wanting to go to New Mexico, but I hope that they do not want to be in Texas because that, like I said, is a very high danger for our area people. So I don't actually support having uh, nuclear waste storage here in uh, Texas at all. Thank you. Mr. Westbrook, can you discuss for us your position on the transfer of high-level radioactive waste through the district? We live in uh, what we as libertarians believe is a free market society. And so, um, if someone has uh, contracted to put their uh, nuclear waste somewhere, we have to allow them the opportunity to do that. However, we also believe in a thing called the non-aggression principle. And that means that we have to consider others whenever we're involved in this. So the consequences 
uh, for having a, a nuclear accident or something like that needs to be so severe that, uh, that the contractor would take every precaution possible uh, to do what they need to do and also be very involved uh, with the local communities and the local governments uh, and the safety um, departments involved so that we don't ever have to worry about anything terrible happening. We, we live here in Amarillo. Uh, some people call us the bomb city. So uh, it's not like we don't have this uh, in our area already. Thank you, Mr. Westbrook. Um, the next question is also for you. What are your priorities regarding the immigration system? I'm glad you asked. Um, I actually was an immigration adjudications officer uh, for the United States Citizenship and Immigration. And the biggest problem we have with that whole system is that it's broken. The laws that we have on the books cater to the very, very intelligent of this world, uh, the very wealthy of this world, and for people who are coming, for example, as immigrants to our area, for example, to serve on farms, to provide services as, as immigrant workers, it's very, very unfair to them and it's, it's, the cards are stacked against them. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to completely revise that system so that it's fair to the individual who is applying uh, on a, on a uh, income-based system. Okay, and Mr. Trujillo, what are your priorities regarding the immigration system? Yes, I know that the immigration system there are many problems with it, and we, the next Congress, have to address this. I mean, this is going to be a huge issue, especially because of uh, climate change is going to affect populations all around the world. And for us, right now, the uh, the policy, the the, admin the current administration, their policy was to just turn away people at the border right there and then, instead of holding them and having them uh, appear at court dates. The problem is we're starting to see a backfire of that because now they're coming in higher, um, higher droves to the border. Now, we actually need immigrants in our system for certain, uh, in our economy, because uh, there are certain jobs that some Americans do not want to uh, actually do. So I think that the uh, path to citizenship has to be there, but uh, everyone has to wait their turn to become a United States citizen. We already go through rigorous background checks, and uh, we have a very good system for that, but it needs to definitely be improved. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We are now going to move the race for railroad commissioner. There are actually four candidates in this race, but two of them will not be joining us tonight. Uh, Republican candidate Jim Wright or James Wright is not appearing. We do have Democratic candidate Krista Castaneda. Uh, libertarian candidate Matt Sterrett is not appearing tonight, and Green Party candidate Kat Green should be appearing. Um, so we will begin with Krista Castaneda. Um, Ms. Castaneda, have you figured out how to join us on audio and video? I'm here. There you are. Very good. So could you begin by telling us about your training, experience, and background that qualifies you for this position. Hi all, I'm Krista Castaneda. I am running for the Railroad Commission. It has not one thing to do with railroads. It's our powerful oil and gas regulator. I have over 35 years of experience in and around the industry, both as an engineer and as an attorney. I have uh, worked on behalf of landowners, royalty owners, companies big and small. And I know this industry inside and out, and I know we can do better. Right now, the uh, operators in the Permian are lighting on fire enough natural gas to power the city of Houston if we would just convert it to electricity. It's been against the law for 100 years. It makes no sense. It causes human health concerns. It causes premature births. And we can do better. We can convert that, elect that natural gas to electricity right there in the Permian um, and uh, stabilize the industry that has been decimated by the pandemic and the attacks of the Saudis and the Russians on our oil industry. It's entirely possible for us to have an economy that's strong, have jobs that we need, and yet have our historical environmental protections. Thank you. 
Okay, now we will move on to Pat Green. Tell us about your training experience and background that prepares you for this position. Yes, thank you. My name is Katya or Kat Gruna, um, Texans say green. And I have an extensive background in environmental justice movements and social justice movements, uh, working with groups like uh, Aquifer Guardians of Urban Areas and Seed Coalition. We work to shut down Dirty Dealy in San Antonio Bear County, which is a really old coal plant. Um, I have had my fingers, if you will, in working to move us away from fossil fuel industry to prevent more pipelines from coming in through especially marginalized communities, indigenous communities, and also working with communities to clean up the pollution from the refineries and extraction industries that the commission oversees. And I also have a business administration background, so I'm familiar also with that side. Okay, we're going to stay with you, Ms. Gruna, and this is a bit of a follow-up on the point you just made. What can the Texas Railroad, Railroad Commission do to ensure compliance with pipeline regulations to avoid environmental harm? Well, they could actually regulate them <laughs> instead of just giving them passes to do what they want. Um, typically, it's like the TN, uh, TCEQ, they rubber stamp things that the industry wants. Um, and even if the regulations are on the book, they get exemptions like with the flaring that um, was mentioned. And also you can hold public hearings and get the community involved and actually work to get people elected to this commission because there's three commissioners so that there's a majority of people who are looking out for the environment and for the people as opposed to looking out for profit. Um, as well as that, we can also look at do we really need more fossil fuel infrastructure or do we need to shift away from that? And if so, then we need to look at stopping permitting new pipelines that are unnecessary. Ms. Castaneda, can you address the same question? What can the Texas Railroad Commission do to further ensure compliance with pipeline regulations to avoid environmental harm? Great question. So I spend a lot of my time educating the public on what the Railroad Commission actually can do and has no power to do. Because like many things relating to the Railroad Commission, people really don't understand what it's capable of doing. And there are many things, especially relating to pipelines that are beyond its jurisdiction and that if the legislature wants to add more to the Railroad Commission plate, it's gonna have to do it. But I know this, as an engineer, one of the very best things that the Railroad Commission can do is make sure that when pipelines cross water that they are adequately designed to make sure that they are as safe as possible, that the environmental damage to bodies of water is as little, little as possible, and to make sure that all hazards relating to that crossing are taken care of, including providing for adequate casing, adequate cementing, and really overseeing the intrusion of that pipeline into that water body. Ms. Castaneda, can you uh, address what, if any, further regulations or limits are needed to address the impact of flaring on the environment? Yeah, friends, look, flaring's been against the law for 100 years. Our foremothers and forefathers knew that the number one thing the Railroad Commission is supposed to be doing is protecting against the waste of our natural resources. So that means not lighting them on fire the minute that we get them out of the ground. If we don't need them, they should stay in the ground. Now, the people in the Permian who are producing the oil want the oil because it's worth a lot or historically has been, but this natural gas comes up with it and they consider it a nuisance or waste product because it costs more to move it to market than it does to simply light it on fire. What we need is for the Railroad Commission to enforce the laws that have been on the books for 100 years. If we were capture that flare, we would have a whole new energy source. We would not be violating our environmental protections. And really, very little new regulation is required, just the political will to enforce the law. Now turning to Ms. Gruna, what, if any, further regulations or limits are needed, in your opinion, to address the impact of flaring on the environment? 
The only thing I would add to that is that there's new technology that's just emerging that can be installed at the extraction point. Um, and if the pilot projects are going well on them, their little reactors there that they can install, then you know, requiring such things in addition to the regulations that exist. Thank you very much to both of you. We are now going to move to the race for Texas Supreme Court Chief Justice. And because judges are prohibited from answering questions on matters that might come before them in court, and we have so many judges on the ballot this year, we're limiting the questions for our judicial candidates to the same two questions for every candidate. And so for this first race, Texas Supreme Court Chief Justice. On the ballot, we have Republican Nathan Hecht, Democratic candidate Amy Clark Meacham, Libertarian candidate Mark Ash, who is not appearing tonight, and Green Party candidate Charles Waterbury, who is not appearing tonight. Um, and so we will begin with the Republican candidate Nathan Hecht, Mr. Hecht, I think your microphone is still muted. There you are. Now, if we can see you. Now we can see you and hear you. So begin by telling us a little bit about your training background and experience that qualifies you for this position. I'm Nathan Hecht. I've served on the Texas Supreme Court for 32 years, longer than anyone in history. I'm president of the National Conference of Chief Justices and chair of the National Center for State Courts. I've worked for years to secure hundreds of millions of dollars in state and federal funding to provide free legal services to hundreds of thousands of poor Texans, including veterans. I've also worked with the Supreme Court's Children's Commission and Mental Health Commission to improve handling cases with children and mental health issues. And while I've been Chief Justice, I've led the court in staying completely current in its work. My experience is crucial in helping Texas courts navigate the COVID pandemic. I'm running again to continue my work in service to the people of Texas, and I ask for your vote. Now we're going to turn to Amy Clark Meacham. Tell us about your training experience and background that qualifies you for this position. Thank you so much for having me here tonight, Amarillo in the Panhandle. My name is Judge Amy Clark Meacham. I am a three-term district court judge from Travis County, Texas, a wife, a mom, a frequent lecturer with the Texas Center for Legal Ethics, and the judicial liaison for the Administrative and Public Law Council in Texas. I'm the first woman in Texas history to even run for this position because I believe strongly it is time for a new generation of judicial thought leaders to restore fairness and balance to this monolithic court. I believe Texans deserve a system of justice that respects the Constitution and protects the role of citizen juries. And we need to elect fair and impartial judges to help break down the barriers that often prevent women and persons of color and working families from obtaining equal justice under law. I've raised my, ran my hand three times and taken an oath to the Constitution. The oath and the rule of law matters to me and I know it matters to you as well. Thank you so much for having me here and I would appreciate your vote. Ms. Meacham, what do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Supreme Court? Um, I believe the issues facing the Supreme Court, and some of the court, some of them the court has addressed well this year, others I think not as much, all deal with COVID right now. Um, in the COVID-19 era, um, they have been a, sending out emergency orders and deciding what cases are going to be um, decided by a jury trial or not and putting things off a little bit with some jury trials and allowing others to go forward. Uh, one thing they have done that I disagree with is they did not extend the moratorium back in May for evictions and for debt collections. Um, and some of the other things that they are dealing with right now involve election cases. And I wish that back in May they would have also decided that it made it clearer that every citizen in the state could vote by mail in the middle of a pandemic. Um, those are the things that I think are on the table right now, election issues, issues related to COVID and many other emergency issues in the time of a pandemic. Thank you, same question for you, um, Mr. Hecht. 
What do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Supreme Court? The most pressing issues are clearly those related to the pandemic. Uh, we have had to adjust court proceedings throughout the state dramatically to keep going. Uh, it's a new world. And, um, you know, the first of March, I thought Zoom meant to hurry down the street. And now here we are, everything's on Zoom, including court proceedings, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, we need to facilitate those. We need to try to work through the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, we, there are moratoriums on um, eviction cases and uh, the Supreme Court has facilitated uh, an eviction diversion program to help pay both the rent and help landlords uh, through these hard times. So th those are the hard things that we're up against uh, right this minute. Thank you both very much. We are now going to move to Texas Supreme Court Place 6 for the unexpired term. We have Republican candidate Jane Bland and Democratic candidate Kathy Cheng. And so far, neither of them have joined us. Okay, there is Jane Bland, and we are waiting for Kathy Cheng. Um, there is Kathy Cheng. So we will begin with Jane Bland. Um, Ms. Bland, can you tell us about your training experience and your background that prepares you for this position? Hi, good evening. I'm Jane Bland, and thank you to the Amarillo League of Women Voters for organizing this presentation and highlighting uh, the judicial races, which are so important uh, to so many Texans. I am a judge with 22 years of experience. I started out as a trial judge in Houston back in 1997, served for six years there, and then uh, was on the Court of Appeals for 15 years when Governor Abbott appointed me a year ago to the Texas Supreme Court. So I'm the newest justice on the court, but I bring to the court uh, 22 years of judicial experience and also um, the same sort of devotion to the rule of law, uh, applying the law as written and not based on my personal agenda or, or what I think the law should be, uh, and a strong work ethic for improvements to the administration of justice in Texas. Uh, which I have done at every level of my career. So thanks for having me. Okay, and then we'll turn to Kathy Cheng. What training experience and background can you tell us about that qualifies you for this position? Ms. Cheng, I think you're still muted. There you go. Hi, League of Women Voters of Amarillo. Thank you for this opportunity. I am a private practitioner out of the greater Houston area uh, for over 20 years. Uh, my areas of practice have included uh, commercial uh, litigation, family law, probate, tax real estate, and a uh, majority of those types of cases are usually heard by the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, Texas Supreme Court, uh, is, besides areas of practice, I am also an arbitrator mediator, and I've also served for at least six years as the adjudication officer for the city of Houston. Uh, the ambit uh, the ambit, well, areas of practice uh, from my legal experience is what's uh, required with respect to the various cases that we've, that, uh, that's heard on the Texas Supreme Court. So with that in mind, that is something that I will bring to the Texas Supreme Court because not all justices have that type of wide range of experience. Ms. Bland, what do you believe are the most cases Well, I agree with Chief Justice Heck and uh, Judge Meacham that um, uh, handling our state justice system during the time of pandemic to make sure that we still um, have access to justice in Texas and that we keep our dockets moving despite the challenges that we're all having to adapt to, uh, whether, whether we're judges or parents or no matter what we do in our professions, we're all adapting. Uh, and our court is going to continue to work with assembling stakeholders from all perspectives uh, uh, to work for solutions to allow 
um, cases to keep moving forward during the pandemic. And, you know, a silver lining is that we, we have learned a lot uh, in terms of technology and using it to facilitate uh, efficiency and save costs for all Texans and hopefully improve access to the courts for all Texans. Uh, and we'll take some of those skills into the post pandemic era. So it's not all bad. <laughs> okay, now turning to Ms. Chang, what do you believe are the most pressing issues for the Texas Supreme Court? Well, one of the pressing issues that the uh, Supreme Court uh, lacks is right now a lack of diversity. Diversity uh, uh, lenses to be able to see the various aspects of the laws that's been interpreted on the highest court. Uh, when we ask any constituents across the state of Texas, how would you feel about going to a courtroom with 12 peers of one makeup? No one likes it. The Texas Supreme Court with the nine justices right now is lacking diversity. We don't have the lenses required for that in-depth uh, analysis and critical thinking required uh, of looking at the laws and to allow that critical debate. Uh, when you're looking at the, the laws being interpreted for all Texans and when we're looking at the uh, justice uh, for all, the reality is it cannot be a justice for all when it's individuals having the same type of lenses viewing the same angles. If we look at the recent rulings with the Texas Supreme Court, it contradicts itself with respect to the rulings and what it's actually doing with the oral hearings and having Zoom or uh, asking constituents to go. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Chang, you're out of time. Okay, thank you both. We are now going to move on to Texas Supreme Court Place 7. And Texas Supreme Court Place 7, we are joined by Republican candidate Jeff Boyd. Democratic candidate Stacey Williams should be here soon. And William Strange III is not appearing, but is running as a libertarian candidate. So we'll begin with Republican Jeff Boyd. Uh, Mr. Boyd, can you tell us about your training experience and background that qualifies you for this position? Hi, thank you, and uh, thank you all for hosting this uh, forum as well. And Judge Williams, good to see you again. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Jeff Boyd. I am an Air Force brat, grew up all over the world, ended up going to Abilene Christian University and getting a degree in biblical studies and served as a minister for five years before deciding to go to law school. I practiced for 15 years in private practice in Austin, three additional years heading up litigation for the state of Texas at the Attorney General's office, and two years working as general counsel and chief of staff for the governor of the state of Texas. Governor Rick Perry appointed me to the court eight years ago. I came to the court with three commitments. One, I would apply the law as written, not based on what I think it ought to mean or what I think someone may have intended, but what they actually wrote. Two, I would honor the jury's role in our system. And three, I would not be a Republican or Democrat once I put my robe on. And I've uh, striven to uphold those commitments throughout my time on the court. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boyd. You're out of time. We will turn to Ms. Williams. What training experience and background qualifies you for the position? Good evening. I am Judge Stacy Williams, and I'm in my second term as a district court judge in Dallas County, where I hear issues such as oil and gas, real estate, personal injury, medical malpractice, and consumer issues. However, prior to becoming a district court judge, I had experience as a trial attorney as well as a decision maker. As a trial attorney, I was a trial attorney with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I was in-house corporate counsel in the telecommunications, retail, and defense industries. As a decision maker, I've been a municipal court judge for the city of Dallas, an administrative judge for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and an arbitrator writing detailed decisions for DART, the U.S. Postal Service, NASDAQ, FINRA, Washington Metropolitan Airport Board. I'm a native Texan. Um, I'm a graduate of the Georgetown University Law Center, Smith College, and the Hockaday School. And I'm most proud of my program that I created called the Citizen Civil Academy, a free nonpartisan program to educate citizens about the civil court process. I've had a long time, um, but 
We will go on to the next question with Mr. Boyd. What do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Supreme Court? Thank you. Well, it's, it's difficult to follow the two, uh, actually four that have gone before us. Everybody recognizes the challenges that this pandemic have caused for the entire court system. And because the Supreme Court is responsible for ultimately managing the statewide system, that presents a real challenge for us. So I'll acknowledge that. But what I would add to it is <clears throat> I just think the judicial system as a whole, and we see this in the statistics, has just been so difficult for average people to access. It's long been too difficult for poor people to access. And we've established numerous programs, legal aid programs, volunteer legal services programs, of which I previously served as the president here in Austin. Uh, but it's that uh, middle class group that our system has grown so expensive uh, that it's even difficult for them. I've often said I could never have afforded myself when I was an attorney. Um, we're establishing ways to increase efficiency and reduce those costs, and we've got to keep doing that in the years going ahead. Mr. Boyd, you are out of time, and we will turn to Ms. Williams. What do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Supreme Court? Ms. Williams, you are still muted. All right, thank you. So um, in addition to what's already been discussed, I think the Texas Supreme Court has a perception problem. There's a perception in the public that the Texas Supreme Court is not fair and that it is biased towards businesses. And one of the first things I'll do when I get on the Texas Supreme Court is to implement a study to see if we can um, stop this perception because when people don't believe in the system they don't believe in an institution and the texas supreme court is way too important of an institution to have the backroom whispers that you know you really aren't going to get fairness or justice in the court unless you're represented by one of the favorite nine and you're a multi-billion dollar corporation so perception is the issue but we need to address it and tackle it head on Thank you both. We will now move on to Texas Supreme Court Place 8. And joining us for Texas Supreme Court Place 8, we have Republican candidate Brett Busby. We have Democratic candidate Gisela Triana. And Libertarian candidate Tom Oxford is not appearing tonight. So we will begin with Brett Busby. Can you tell us about your training background and experience that qualifies you for this position? Yes, good evening. My name is Brett Busby and I grew up partly in Amarillo and attended St. Andrews and Wolfland Elementary. So it's nice to be back with you in the Panhandle tonight. I'm a seventh generation Texan and a third generation Eagle Scout. And Governor Abbott appointed me last year to the Texas Supreme Court place a based on my 22 years of appellate experience as a board certified appellate lawyer and also my six years of experience as a fair court of appeals judge i was honored to earn the support of all democrats and republicans when the texas senate voted unanimously to approve my appointment to the court my job as a judge is to give everyone the fair day in court that they deserve and to rule impartially based on the law never as it is uh, never based on personal or partisan preference Take it from the lawyers who know us best. I, I'm honored to be rated consistently among the best and the most impartial appellate judges in Texas and have also received uh, all of the major newspaper endorsements in this race and I'd be honored to have your vote. Now turning to Gisela Triana, um, can you tell us about your training experience and background that qualifies you for this position? Good evening, I'm Justice Gisela Triana and I wanna thank the Amarillo League of Women Voters for having us tonight. Um, I'm running for the Texas Supreme Court in place eight. Um, and I've been born and bred here in Texas, was born in Houston, raised in San Antonio, came to Austin to UT School of Law over 32 years ago. I have spent most of my 32 year legal career in public service. Started off, started off as a prosecutor in the Travis County Attorney's Office worked at the Secretary of State's office and had my own firm before I became a judge. I've been a judge for the last 24 years, serving on the municipal court, on the justice of the peace court, the county court at law, 
the district judge, uh, the district court for 14 years, and currently I'm on the third court of appeals. If elected, I'll be the only person to have ever served on the Supreme Court that has served on every lower level court in Texas and on the appellate bench. I believe that experience is important, and therefore I'm asking for your vote. Once again, I'm Justice Gisela Triana. Thank you. Mr. Busby, can you tell us what you believe are the most pressing pressing issues now facing the Texas Supreme Court? Sure. Well, as, as people have pointed out, the pandemic is something that the court has been spending a lot of time on and issuing a lot of emergency orders to be sure that uh, the wheels of justice can keep turning safely, and technology has been a huge part of that. Uh, Texas is now one of the leaders in the whole country in terms of uh, online hearings so that we can continue to do our business safely. And I think that that has some uh, important implications for how we organize our system of justice going forward. I'm one of the court's liaisons to the Access to Justice Commission uh, and trying to be sure that all Texans have access to our courts. And one of the, the things that I think we can learn from the pandemic is that um, online hearings in appropriate cases, even after the pandemic, are going to make it easier for people to obtain counsel. They're also going to help lower the cost of legal services and allow parties and witnesses to participate while taking less time away from their work. Uh, they can also facilitate obtaining evidence and put children and other witnesses at ease. So I'm committed to revising our rules to incorporate that. Okay, now Ms. Triana, the same question. What do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the court? Well, being the uh, eighth of, of eight to go, uh, everybody took the good answers, but absolutely, um, you know, COVID and the pandemic is a major concern for the court. I would say another pressing issue is not only access to justice, but actually getting justice once you get to the courthouse. It is extremely important that um, below poverty level people are able to access justice. When um, I was on the Travis County bench, uh, we had a lot of programs that dealt with what we call pro se, people who were not represented by uh, attorneys to make sure that they could get their, for day, for, uh, their fair day in court. I believe that it is important not only for you to be able to get to the courthouse, but once you get to the courthouse, you should be able to expect that you be treated with respect, with dignity, and that you have a judge that's willing to listen to all sides of the story without any preconceived um, ideas. Uh, justice should be for all, not just the wealthy and the well-connected. And I believe that we need to make sure our courts represent that. Thank you both. Okay, we will now be turning to the Court of Criminal Appeals, place three. And we will be joined by Republican candidate Burt Richardson and Democratic candidate Elizabeth Frizzell. Maybe we'll be joined by them at any moment. Waiting to see if any of them are with us. Do we have the um, candidate who is appearing for the Court of Criminal Appeals place four? I have received a message that someone is coming. So we're waiting to find out. Okay, we have Republican candidate Burt Richardson and Democratic candidate Elizabeth Frizzell for Court of Criminal Appeals Place 3. And we will start with Mr. Richardson. Tell us about your training experience and background that qualifies you for this position. Hi, good evening. My name is Judge Burt Richardson. I am currently the incumbent judge on place three of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. I have been a state judge for over 20 years. I've been a lawyer for over 30 years. Uh, I was a trial and appellate lawyer, both in the DA's office and in the U.S. Attorney's office in San Antonio. Prior to becoming judge, I taught at the university level for over 15 years. And for several years, I worked as a senior visiting judge in over 50 counties across the state. Um, I had tried and presided over every type of case that the Court of Criminal Appeals handles at the time I was elected. And I believe I'm one of the leaders on the court uh, in actual innocence case at this time. Thank you very much. And Elizabeth Frizzell, can you tell us a little bit about your background experience and qualifications for this position? I'm Judge Elizabeth Davis Frizzell and I'm running for Texas Court of Criminal Appeals Place Three. 
I've been practicing criminal law for the past 27 years. I started with the U.S. Department of Justice. I have also been a municipal court judge for the city of Dallas, city of Lucas, city of Princeton, and city of Bog Springs. I've been the presiding judge of County Criminal Court Number 11, which is a criminal assault family violence court. I served there for eight years, and then I've also been a criminal district court judge presiding over all types of cases from assault to rape, robbery, murder, and capital murder. I have been in private practice as a defense attorney a total of 15 years. I have chaired and vice chaired the Judicial Nominating Commission, which selects the judges for the city of Dallas. I've co-chaired the Criminal Justice Committee for Dallas Bar Association, and I'm also a graduate of the Texas Judicial College. I am running for this seat because I want to see fairness and justice for everyone and to make sure that no one is wrongfully convicted and spending time in a, the penitentiary for an office they did not commit. Thank you. Mr. Richardson, uh, can you tell us what you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Court of Appeals? I, I think like every court in the state right now dealing with the pandemic, keeping our docket moving, uh, allowing the litigants to get their cases filed heard, uh, and issued in a timely basis is probably at the top of the list. Uh, I think we've adapted to that uh, once we got past the IT issues and, and we were able to have oral arguments uh, via Zoom. We have our conferences weekly. Uh, I think most of us are looking forward to the day we can come back and meet in person. Uh, but I think the second issue that we deal with right now is the uh, ever-changing uh, opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court and, and how to, to guess what they want us to do when we have certain issues before us. That range anywhere from search and seizure issues to death penalty cases. Uh, those are the two pressing issues I see uh, facing our court right now. Ms. Frizzell, the same questions. What do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals? One of the most pressing issues are wrongful convictions. Texas has 437 wrongful convictions right now in the state of Texas. And out of all the states in the, st in the United States, Texas is number one in incarcerating. So if we incarcerate someone, we have to make sure that we get it right. And too often, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals does not do that. There are people in the penitentiary right now for offenses they didn't commit. I know because I represented one of them. He served 16 years in the penitentiary for offense he did not commit. He was later freed through DNA testing, but his life was never the same after that. I want to make sure that when we're reviewing the trial court judge's decisions, since I've been a trial court judge, I know when they get it right and when they get it wrong. I wanna make sure when we review that, we get it right the first time before someone serves time in the penitentiary for an offense they did not commit. We also have to look at disparate sentencings, but fairness and balance is definitely needed on this court. Thank you both. We are now going to turn to the Court of Criminal Appeals play four. There are two on the ballot. Republican candidate Kevin Yeary, who is not appearing with us this evening, and Democratic candidate Tina Clinton. And is Ms. Clinton joining us? Yes, okay. So uh, beginning and, and in this case, ending with Tina Clinton, what training experience and background qualifies you for this position? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Tina Clinton, and I have 25 years of experience in criminal law. I started as a prosecutor. I became a defense attorney, practiced at the state and federal level. I became a municipal judge, a county criminal court judge, and now I'm a felony criminal district court judge. I have 14 years of tri uh, trial court experience um, on the bench. Um, combined between my legal experience as a lawyer and judge, I have 400 trials under my belt. Um, I have taught nationally on very difficult topics, as cyber crimes and technology in the courts. Um, I have also been very honored to teach my Texas colleagues judicial ethics, and I was selected to be one of the staff members in the um, what we call College of New Judges, where new judges come in and we uh, do a long seminar on making sure that they're prepared for the bench. So it is my honor to be the, the nominee for the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals Place Four. Ms. Clinton, can you tell us what you think are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals? 
I believe that once um, the, the trials start um, in the courts, you are going to have a um, list of appeals that deal with constitutional issues that are raised because of COVID. Uh, for example, the confrontation clause, whether it is sufficient that we held hearings, whether we had possibly trials before the court using Zoom. There's also issues um, such as speedy trial that many of the courts will have to face and that will have to be litigated. There's also an issue of actual innocence standard. There is a discussion amongst this court as to whether the standard for proof on actual innocence should be raised. There is even a discussion as to whether actual innocence is philosophically a real thing. Even though there are 2,673 people in the nation that have been exonerated and 435 in Texas, this debate is going on inside Texas and it leaves our jurisprudence at risk. Thank you very much. We are now going to move to the Court of Criminal Appeals Place 9. Republican candidate David Newell and Democratic candidate Brandon Birmingham are the candidates in this race. And we are joined by Brandon Birmingham. So we will begin. Um, let me ask you, what, are, what training experience and background qualify you for this position? Well, first of all, thank you all. I'm sorry. It, is it my turn? I think so. I, 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 the clock over. He's fine. Mr. Newell was not here when we started, but he does appear on the ballot first. So we'll start with Republican David Newell, then we'll go to Brandon Birmingham. My apologies. No, it's okay. Thank you so much for having me, and, and thank you to Judge Birmingham for being so cordial, and thank you to the Amarillo, uh, Le Amarillo League of Women Voters for putting on this event. Uh, my name is David Newell. I'm your judge on the Court of Criminal Appeals. I've been there since 2015, and uh, I'm basically, I, I have over 20 years of experience as a lawyer and a judge in criminal law. I've appeared at every level of the criminal justice system as a lawyer, from JP Court all the way to, to the United States Supreme Court. And I've also had extensive experience handling criminal appeals, which is the business of the Court of Criminal Appeals. It's, it's in the title. Uh, I've, I've handled hundreds of those. I'm board certified in criminal law and criminal appellate law. One of the reasons I'm running again is because, as mentioned earlier, one of the things I think is facing courts right now is, is uh, the discussion of actual innocence and wrongful convictions. And I, along with my colleague, Judge Richardson, have been a leading voice standing up for overturning wrongful convictions and recognizing the need to declare those who have been wrongfully convicted actually innocent. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Birmingham, can you tell us what training experience and background qualifies you for this position? Sure, good evening. Um, my name is Brandon Birmingham and I'm a judge in Dallas County right now. I'm in my second term as a felony trial court judge. And before that, I spent some years at the DA's office trying cases. And I think that's the mo one of the most important things that a judge on the Court of Criminal Appeals can actually have is that real world in the trenches experience of trying cases, putting them together, using their wisdom and their common sense, talking to jurors, uh, presiding over trials, seeing how the evidence comes out and what its impact is on a jury's verdict. And I've done that for 20 years now. I've never been outside of the courtroom. I've spent every minute of my time as a lawyer and a judge inside of a courtroom. And fundamentally, that's what the Court of Criminal Appeals does, is it decides whether or not there's an error in a trial that warrants a new trial or a reversal or something like that. I think most Texans want a judge uh, for that court who's actually tried these cases, has actually put them together and participated in all the kinds of cases that are up on the Court of Criminal Appeals. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Newell, can you tell us what you believe are the most pressing issues facing the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals? Well, I think everyone has said something about COVID, so I guess I would be remiss if I didn't. But I do agree with what uh, Judge Clinton uh, said earlier about how we are going to be facing a lot of constitutional issues with regard to COVID types of situations. But I, I think that once those things are passed, you're going to see the same thing that you, you've seen for a while, which is we're very concerned with junk science and whether junk science should have been admitted and how to handle those kinds of cases. And I've been a strong voice on the court for making sure that those kinds of convictions are overturned uh, when, when the uh, conviction is based upon junk science. Uh, additionally, I think that the rise of technology and how it affects searches and seizures is also a significant issue that the court is having to deal with 
as technology changes and as the United States Supreme Court reexamines its understanding of the expectation of privacy test, it's important to make sure that you have someone who's like me who's taught extensively on criminal law issues for over a decade now. So that's why that's why I think is facing us. They're the most important things that are facing the court right now. And Mr. Birmingham, same questions. What do you believe are the most important issues facing the court? Well, the most important issue that I see that people tell me about, not only the people that I'm actually in court with, but uh, out here on the campaign trail and um, going all around Texas, but not leaving my office at the same time, is that there's a lack of confidence in our criminal justice system. And to me, there's been too many decisions out of the Court of Criminal Appeals over the last 25 years, uh, all the way up until this summer. Uh, that have shaken the core of the confidence that the public has in the Court of Criminal Appeals. I don't believe that we should be fighting over uh, whether or not relevant evidence should be tested. I believe if evidence has been admitted and was used to convict somebody and later on we determined that that evidence wasn't really all it was cracked up to be, then the person who was convicted on the basis of that type of flimsy evidence, well, they should get a fair shot. At the same time, I don't believe in long, lengthy appeals. It's the other thing that I hear all the time is that there's too long between the final conviction uh, and the trial. And that takes a really long time. Those are the issues that I want to work on, restoring faith and confidence in our criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you both. We will now turn to the State Board of Education race in District 15. Republican candidate Jay Johnson will not be appearing. He advised us that he is unable to attend, but Democratic candidate John Betancourt should be joining us tonight. So we're waiting to see if he is joining us. There he is. Um, so we will begin, Mr. Betancourt, with a question about your training experience and background. I'm waiting for your audio and video to catch up to us. There you are. So tell us a little bit about your background and experience that qualifies you for this position. But unmute first. Good evening and thank you so much for having me. It is such a true honor and blessing to be amongst you. My name is John Betancourt and I am the Democratic nominee candidate for the Texas State Board of Education District 15 position. District 15 encompasses 77 West Texas counties amongst our state. I am a former school board trustee for Amarillo ISD, and I learned early on in my service with that governing board that the real true change in the impact regarding public education happens at the state level. If elected, I promise to everybody watching and all my constituents in all the 15 counties that encompass this seat, and I will be a champion for public education. And I will go and fight for not only your children, but also the teachers and the staff of our educational system. As we have discussed extensively tonight, a lot of the issues revolve around COVID-19 and its effects on our community, and that is especially seen in education. What are your priorities to ensure that students receive the best possible education in light of the virus and the distance education that has been called into play? Every student in our great state deserves a quality educational experience. And part of that along the lines with the COVID pandemic, for the ones that uh, are doing home instruction, it's connectivity. So we need to make certain that we provide funds so that our school districts can participate in uh, the connectivity with uh, the internet to make sure that our rural students in our cities, our students in our inner cities have access to that broadband access. Now, I will also mention that one of the hot topics that this governing body has been discussing right now has been the discussion about sex education and science inclusion in their curriculum. So that takes us seamlessly into our next question. What is your philosophy for setting curriculum standards? Definitely, I, first and foremost, you have to look at the TEKS and implementing your TEKS. And we all know that uh, the TEKS do need some improvements. And so when you set your TEKS and that's when you start looking at your curriculum. And it's a given fact that once you set your curriculum, you start looking at what textbooks that you are going to be using for, for that. 
And so um, I firmly believe in implementing Mexican American studies, African American studies, Asian American studies, Indigenous American studies, having some type of science based curriculum and also providing sex education just for the simple fact that there is a high in teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. Thank you very much. Um, that is all for this race. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. We will now move on to the race for Potter County Attorney. And we will be joined by Republican candidate Scott Brumley and Democratic candidate Ryan Brown, who are running for Potter County Attorney. And we have Scott Brumley joining us. And we have Ryan Brown joining us. Um, so let's begin with our question. We ask everyone, uh, Mr. Brumley, can you tell us a little bit about your training experience and qualifications for this position? Certainly. Uh, again, echoing what other candidates have said, thank you to the league for uh, putting together this forum and thank you to those who are watching for having the interest in your government to pay attention to all of this. Uh, I've been the county attorney in Potter County for 15 years. I was the civil division chief in the same office for 10 years before that. Been practicing law for 28 years. Uh, I am uh, admitted to practice not only in the state courts of Texas, but in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Texas, or the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and the United States Supreme Court, uh, because the county finds itself in federal litigation uh, fairly frequently. Uh, I'm former president of the Texas District and County Attorneys Association, as well as chair of the state bar government law section. Uh, and so I have a broad a uh, network of colleagues throughout the state to, from whom to draw on ideas to continue to improve the work of the office. Thank you. We now move to Ryan Brown. Again, tell us a little bit about your background experience and qualifications. Sure, I, and like everyone else, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this on. I think this is a great thing. Uh, and I think it's really great, everyone that's watching this and is politically interested and wants to know what's going on. Uh, I'm a licensed lawyer. I've been licensed for 10 years. Uh, I'm a criminal defense civil rights lawyer. Uh, I was a staff lawyer for the Innocence Project of Texas for several years, uh, organizing law students and uh, uh, college students, interns and stuff down in Houston. Uh, the statewide arson review with them. Uh, got the first uh, junk science writ uh, law passed in the country uh, back in 2011. And I know how the system can go wrong. I see every day how people are, are ground up uh, by the criminal justice system here in Potter County. And I, I know how to fix it. Okay, we will turn back to Mr. Brumley. Uh, October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. What concrete steps would you take to address domestic violence in our community? We're, uh, our office is already is taking several concrete steps. We have, over the last uh, two years, had a uh, dedicated domestic violence prosecutor. That is all the pro those are all the cases the prosecutor handles. We also have a ded dedicated domestic violence uh, investigator and victim assistance coordinator. Uh, part of the problem we run into in domestic violence cases is maintaining uh, good and useful contact with the victim. Often the victim uh, has, has, has been in, involved in a cycle of violence uh, for, for a very long time and sees no way out. Uh, our job is to try and be uh, a part of that way out uh, of the cycle of domestic violence. Uh, we also are working uh, to educate judges and jurors uh, in our jurisdiction who believe, quite frankly, that domestic violence is, is a matter to be dealt with in the home and it's not their problem. We are going to turn to Mr. Brown now for the same question, October being National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. What steps would you take to address this issue in our community? Well, this is a complicated issue and these are tough cases for defense lawyers uh, and prosecutors. 
Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind that at the Potter County Attorney's Office, we're talking about misdemeanors, not necessarily repeat cases or serious, uh, you know, cases where someone got hurt seriously. I mean, it, it happens sometimes. But I think that uh, it's important to expand pretrial diversion options because these offenses carry terrible collateral consequences that can cause you the loss of a number of rights. Um, and what, what often happens is that tempers uh, calm down. Uh, people want to, people go to counseling, people want to work things out on their own. And I think it's important to let them do that. And there's a number of counties that have pre-trial diversion programs to take care of the uh, appropriate cases. And it's also uh, less of a burden cost-wise on the city or the county, I'm sorry. The next question, Mr. Brown, is what is your view on recent social justice demonstrations across the United States and your position on how that issue, um, as it relates, how, it, how does that issue relate to Potter County? Um, I, I think that people, people are fed up uh, with police officers that, uh, that I mean, there are, there's plenty of good police officers. I've got friends that are police officers, but they're tired of the bad ones that face no repercussions from their actions. And I think this is part of a larger problem. Uh, there was a study done by the Sixth Amendment Center on Potter and Armstrong County, the indigent defense system specifically, and the entire system is broken. People sit in jail, uh, people sometimes are abused by cops, and I think that uh, the whole system has to be reformed. And I think it starts with the misdemeanor system at the Potter County Attorney's Office. Um, and the ways you fix that are a public defender's office. I mean, I, I would fight for that. I think it's, there's savings there, hidden savings, it's cost efficient. And I think that um, the county and defendants get better justice. Mr. Brumley, now I will turn to you. What is your view on the recent social justice demonstrations and that issue as it relates to our county? Well, at the national level, uh, of course, uh, we've seen the videos, we're aware of the issues. Uh, it is entirely legitimate uh, for people to protest, to seek uh, the remedies that they believe would rectify the problems they see in the criminal justice system. At the same time, we've seen violence, we've seen rioting, we've seen destruction of property. Uh, those are not means of peaceful protest. Those are not legitimate ways to bring about change in the system. Uh, we have been blessed in Amarillo that we have not seen that. Uh, if so, if we were to see it, uh, the matter would have to be handled as other criminal matters are handled. Uh, I would quickly note that much of what was discussed in terms of uh, justice issues in Potter County already are uh, in the works of rectification. We, uh, the Commissioner's Court has agreed to create a public defender's office and we are currently studying pretrial uh, detention uh, policies in order to improve that process. Okay, we're out of time and that's all for this particular race. The next race that we will be looking at tonight is the race for Potter County Constable Precinct 4. Uh, Republican candidate Kerry Haney advised us that he is not able to join us, but we do have Democratic candidate Idella Thomas Jackson, who is joining us tonight. And we will wait for her video to join us but I can see that she's coming. And now she's with us. So, um, Idella Thomas Jackson, can you tell us about your training, background, and experience that has prepared you for this position? Yes, ma'am. And first, I'd like to say thanks for having me. Uh, I want to give thanks to the league for uh, having this forum so everybody can be informed of the candidates. But I am Adela Thomas Jackson, and I am the current constable for Party County Precinct 4. That alone is one of the number one qualifications is that I have been in this position for the last eight years. 
Not only am I the constable, I also have over 26 years of background experience in the, in the field of law enforcement. I have over 20, uh, 2,500 hours of continuing education in uh, criminal justice law, uh, law enforcement, and I am a certified peace officer for the state of Texas. In order to perform this duty, you have to be a, a peace officer for the state of Texas. So I have the education, I have the background, I've had experience, and I'm also uh, educated. I have a couple of uh, associate's degree as it relates to uh, criminal justice law enforcement. And I am looking forward to continue being the constable for Party County Precinct 4. We appreciate your vote. What do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the constable's office in Precinct 4? What I believe is the most pressing issue facing, and I've listened to the other candidates, and it is COVID has really affected everyone uh, in, in all fields of work. And uh, the most pressing issue with the constable's office is evictions. Uh, the current order that was sent down with the memorandum, which uh, pretty much is halting a lot of the evictions, uh, has really affected both parties, whether you know, defend it or the planet. So uh, with COVID, it has slowed down and has halted and a lot of people have been affected um, as it relates to eviction. So that's one of the most pressing issues currently. Thank you very much. We are now going to focus on the propositions that will be on the ballot. There are several city of Amarillo propositions and we have speakers who will be speaking both in favor and against the proposition. The first proposition that we will be discussing is the issuance of $275 million in general obligation bonds for the Convention Center facilities expansion and improvement and the imposition of a tax sufficient to pay the principal of and interest on the bonds. So we will begin with Laura Street, who is going to speak in favor of the proposition. Proposition A has to do with the Civic Center expansion and renovation. 55 years ago, we built a Civic Center that at the time was something that we thought was very uh, risky that we should do that because our, our air force was shutting the uh, airport down. But now we've come to the place where we need to expand and we need to renovate. If we don't, we're gonna lose, continue to lose a lot of con conventions and uh, 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 shows and things like that that we're, we're getting. Um, but over the next several, um, say 50 to 55 or 60 years, we need something that is technologically um, good for us. We're going to lose the WRCA World Championship Ranch Rodeo and the Farm and Ranch Show annually that's here. Um, it is a uh, $20 million in annual economic activity uh, that the taxpayers are generating in addition uh, to what we have, and it is $130 per year for a home that is a $100,000 valuation. Um, okay, we are out of time. Uh, now we will turn to Noah Dawson, who will speak against this proposition. Howdy, I'm Noah Dawson. Uh, thank y'all for having me here. Uh, I'm a writer for local and statewide publications, and I was born and raised here in Amarillo. And I was excited about Prop A until I saw the proposal and the numbers that came along with it. We need a real civic center plan. Prop A is not it. Many are struggling due to COVID and the effects it's had on our healthcare system and economy. Uh, but aside from us not needing a tax increase, the proposal also fails to offer a competitive plan. The cost per seat's higher than many arenas, even when you cut the waste out of our proposal and account for inflation on theirs. Also, few major acts play any shows at arenas with fewer than 10,000 fixed seats. We're getting about 8,000. As far as the rodeo goes, I'm sorry, but Fort Worth's new arena beats this plan in every category. They're going to leave whether we pass it or not. And there's other ways in the proposal, too. City Hall is being replaced for no good reason. It cannot be justified. Anyone can see the numbers. Anyone can see that this is a terrible plan. We need economic relief, not more debt and a tax increase. Okay, thank you both very much. We will now turn to Proposition B, and this proposition reads, to amend Article 5, Section 2 of the Amarillo City Charter 
to provide for a four-year term for the office of mayor and each city council member with those terms being staggered as provided by ordinance and conforming amendments as required by state law. Um, we have two people speaking about this proposition. Speaking for the proposition is Lilia Escajeda and speaking against is Noah Dawson. We will begin with Ms. Escajeda speaking for the proposition. We are recommending four year terms uh, for volunteers, uh, civic duty council members, uh, people who are interested in, in uh, donating time for the city to allow for consistent productivity uh, for city matters to be considered. The first year is always a learning curve and as a previous city council member, I know that. Uh, we have meetings uh, every week, which is, takes up a lot of staff time. We're recommending that meetings are held twice a month and it is no detriment for conducting city business. This may encourage more citizens interested for running for public office because many of them are business owners or people who have other things to tend to and would like to serve, but they can't commit every week uh, to uh, serving on a, a city council. Uh, we also want to make, make sure that we take in the consideration for our city staff to prepare our, our meeting materials because that has to be done by city staff and they have a lot of things on their plate too. Uh, we can always call meetings uh, to order as needed if there's an emergency or something that doesn't, we're not precluding any of that. Uh, and it also gives city council members more time to study the materials and to make comments, et cetera. And after Okay, um, Ms. Escajeda, I think you started talking about the next proposition as well. So we will get to that in a minute, but we're going to stick first to Proposition B. Um, Mr. Dawson, can you speak um, against that proposition, please? So nothing like Prop B has ever been seriously attempted in Amarillo's history. We have two-year terms for reasons which have not changed since our city was founded. The House of Representatives in Washington only has two-year terms. If people can govern our nation in two years, it's kind of silly to think that our city requires longer, don't you think? Besides, they can run for re-election. In fact, every member of our current city council is on their second term, all re-elected by comfortable margins. And there are plenty of people in our city that follow and understand our local government who, if they were elected today, would be ready to start the job tomorrow. As for the worry that voters will flip the boat if we don't have staggered terms, well, that's kind of the reason we have elections, right? Our government derives its legitimacy from the consent of the governed. We need to keep our politicians accountable to we the people. I also have concerns about how this will be implemented. The prop is very vague about if it would be retroactive or not and how exactly staggering terms would work. Amarillo deserves better. Okay, now we'll turn to Proposition C, which reads, to amend Article 5, Section 12A of the Amarillo City Charter, to provide for the mayor and council members to meet to qualify for office on the day of the election canvas and thereafter meet not less than 24 times per calendar year. Ms. Escajeda? Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, meetings uh, for uh, having two meetings a month is really not a detriment for conducting city business. Uh, this may encourage more citizens interested to run for public office because they're not having to be physically present, although they will always be available. And also taking into consideration the time it takes for city staff to prepare all meeting materials and get them distributed. Uh, and meetings can always be called as needed if there is an, an emergent situation that needs to be addressed. Uh, so we were just thinking that maybe uh, holding meetings twice a month would be really more productive because more time goes into preparing and getting feedback. And Mr. Dawson speaking against this proposition. Over the past couple of years, there have been several changes to how city council meetings work. Uh, they used to be in the afternoon when regular people were off work and could show up. Then they moved it to the early morning before city hall was even usually open when most people were either headed to work or taking children to school. Then they moved it to the middle of the work day. Then they spun off public comment into its own meeting just before the regular meeting. Then they stopped doing that and replaced it with an even more restricted uh, 
and limited a public address section of the meeting. Now, I cannot pretend to know their intentions, but I know the effect. It's made it more difficult for people to show up. It's isolated people from being able to interact with their elected officials. Prop C would make this even worse. It would give people fewer opportunities to take an active role in their local government. It could also make our local economy less competitive by reducing opportunities to go over things such as rezoning requests. I think if you run for office, you should at least be willing to put a little time each week into the job, at least show up to listen to the people. So that's why I'm asking voters to vote no on props A, B, and C. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Now, Final thing on our agenda tonight are the uncontested race videos. We asked uh, candidates in uncontested races to submit pre-prepared videos stating their positions. And we have six of those videos that we're going to share with you. Hello, I'm District 87 State Representative for Price. I'm running for re-election, unopposed, and I'm asking for your vote. I look forward to continuing work on our behalf and advocating for our shared panhandle interest at your state capitol. I continue to work on issues important to all of us, such as strengthening access to quality health care, especially in rural areas, supporting our public schools and institutions of higher education, protecting agriculture, sound energy development, public safety, our natural resources, and improving Texas's transportation infrastructure and economic development policies. I presently serve on six committees, including the House Redistricting Committee, Public Health and Natural Resources Committees, and I'm ready for us to begin the 87th legislative session in Austin. While we certainly face challenges, we can look forward with optimism to great opportunities. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum, and I thank all of you for your support. It's a privilege to represent you in the Texas House of Representatives. Hi, I'm Justice Larry Doss of the Seventh Court of Appeals. In July, voters from this region voted nearly 60% in my favor for continued service on the Court of Appeals. I have no opponent in the November election. However, there are two things I want to talk to you about that are important instead. Number one, changes by the state legislature that go into effect mean that in November, you will not have straight ticket voting on your ballot. In other words, when you show up, you will no longer be able to select only Republican or only Democrat by a single push of the button. It's important instead to make sure that you vote for every candidate of your choice. If you don't do that, those that are further down on the ballot will get left out. Number two, if you have a high school student who's interested in participating in law or politics, I provide an internship class for those students. Go to my website, dosfortexas.com, and select the intern tab. Provide that information for me. We're going to be putting together another class in January, and I hope to see your student there. Thanks for your time, and thanks for your vote in November. My name is Randall Sims, and I'm the 47th District Attorney, which includes Potter and Armstrong Counties. Currently, I'm seeking re-election for the fifth time in the 47th Judicial District. I have 35 years of prosecutorial experience 22 of those as a district attorney. I have always run on the platform. My door is always open. During my tenure here, three of the many things we have accomplished are fulfilling the duties of seeking justice. Our statistics are some of the best in the state of Texas, and we have built a very good mental health program for veterans and civilians. I want to encourage everyone to go out and vote for many have given their lives to keep us free. Hello, I'm John Coffey and I'm running unopposed for Potter County Commissioner Precinct 3 in the general election. I'm seeking the position because I want to continue making a positive difference in the Potter County community using my experience coming from a unique perspective. I have a deep and abiding interest in the future of Potter County, the Potter County citizens and the Potter County employees. I believe I can provide a positive balance of consistency on the court while bringing a different point of view to it. I recently retired from the Potter County Sheriff's Office where I served the citizens in the county for well over 35 years. Some of my priorities for the office include the district courts building project. I want to see that it's completed on time, within budget or under, being fiscally responsible for tax dollars and working hard to keep property taxes as low as possible. I believe I'll be a great fit with the court and will be available and attentive to the needs of the public. I have a great amount of background, knowledge, and experience to help me transition into this position, and I sincerely seek to make a difference. 
My name is John Coffey. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chip Parker. I am the Republican candidate for Potter County Constable Precinct 3. Although I am running unopposed, I want everyone to know how very important this position is to me. I have served with the Potter County Sheriff's Office for almost 19 years. Although I am sad to see that chapter of my life come to an end, I'm very excited about the new chapter as Constable. The Constable's main job is to be the bailiff for the JP Court and to serve the papers that are issued through that court. I also believe that the Constable should be out and about in the community, making traffic stops, meeting with citizens of the community, and giving aid when possible. I want everyone to know who I am, where my office is, and also to know that you can feel free to call me if there's anything that I can do to help you. I'm looking forward to serving you, and hopefully I will get to meet very many of you in the future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Forbes, and I'm a Republican running unopposed for Sheriff of Randall County. I would like to first thank the League of Women Voters for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I'm a lifelong resident of Randall County. I grew up here, I got married here, I raised a family here, and for the past 27 years, I've had the privilege of serving the citizens of Randall County at the Randall County Sheriff's Office. I'm a strict constitutionalist, which means my most important duty as a peace officer is the protection of your constitutional rights. As sheriff, I will provide professional law enforcement services in a cost-effective manner. And although I'm running unopposed for this office, I humbly ask for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you and God bless. Hi, I'm Paula Hicks and I am the unopposed Republican candidate for Randall County Constable, Precinct 4. The position of constable was laid upon my heart while going through the Law Enforcement Academy and something I dreamed would become reality. I believe the constable's office is a representative of the people of Randall County. I want to thank all of my supporters and I stand behind my promise to be financially responsible steward with the county resources and not to be a tax burden. I will bring loyalty and credibility back to the constable's office. I have strong work values and with those I plan to protect the citizens of my county. I look forward to working for Randall County and again thank you for the opportunity to serve this great community. As we wrap up this League of Women Voters Forum coming to you from the Panhandle PBS studios on the Amarillo College Washington Street campus, I want to now turn the program over to Linda Vaughn, the Director of Forums for the League of Women Voters for closing remarks. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Linda Vaughn and I have the privilege to be this year's Director of Forum for the Emerald League of Women Voters. I would like to say first, thanks to all the candidates who have participated with us alive and those who uploaded their videos. This took precious time and for that we are grateful. COVID has been a challenge to get out and mingle with people, but with the aid of our friends here at, at Panhandle Public Broadcast System, we've been able to continue the league's tradition of bringing the candidates to the people. So our heartfelt thanks goes out to Kyle Arnett, Karen Welch, Hillary Hulsey, Hulsey Stevie Bershears, and to our moderator, Jill Gibson. The Amarillo League works tirelessly to ensure that you, the public, can be informed and be an active participant in government through avenues like this forum and the publication of our nonpartisan voters guide, which we want you to know have already been delivered and distributed to over 75 different locations around Amarillo and Canyon. Now we do these things with the funds that we get from league membership dues and through your kind donation. The Amarillo League of Women Voters has approximately 100 members. Isn't that a 
wonderful thing since this is the 100th year that the League of Women Voters in the United States has been supporting the fact that women are strong political forces. Now, even though the word women, we have in this, we want you to know that we have several men who are also League members. So we are in the 21st century and we do want men to be joined with us. There are several ways, because I know you're asking yourself right now, how can I join? Well, you can contact a League member. They will get you an application, because I know that some of you know somebody out there who's a League member. And if you don't, go to our Facebook page. And while you're there, make sure you like the Facebook. You can go to our website, my dot lwv dot org and download an application. Send it in by snail mail. Send it to Amarillo League of Women Voters, P.O. Box 19333, Amarillo, Texas 79114. Or you can contact the League at 806-337-2148. That number again, 806 337 2148. You can also email us at Amarillo LVWV, Amarillo LWV at gmail.com. Our yearly membership dues are $65 for an individual, $97 for a couple living in the same household, or $5 for students. And I do want the students to know, I know $5 is a lot sometimes for students, especially those who aren't working or just are working and they're doing other things. But we have a scholarship fund set up for students. Ask us about that. Now, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you. Thank you to all of you who have joined in with us. And thank you to our president, Sonia Lipson and to all the Amarillo League of Women Voters members for all the hard work that they did to put on this forum. Again, we'd like to thank you for participating in our candidates forum. And remember, we want you to vote. Have a good night.